Ahoy hoy, it's Michaela from Team Retro, where we like retro games and we like the devices that bring them to us. So about three weeks ago, I finally saw on AliExpress that Miu Minis were coming back in stock. So I was able to snag one of these devices for about $40. And I've been looking forward to reviewing one of these for the channel for a long time, but for a good chunk of months, it seemed like it was near impossible to get your hands on these devices. And with good reason for the price and portability of this device, it's become very popular among retro device enthusiasts. And it was worth the wait because I got the supposed version 2 revamp of this device. So the version I'm showing off in this video has the better battery and supposedly a better OCA laminated screen. Which in my specific case apparently was laminated with somebody's hair under the screen because I received my unit with a tiny hair in the top left of the screen that I just can't get rid of. But we're going to ignore that because I really don't want to go through the hassle of getting another Miu Mini. So instead, we're going to go ahead and see what the stock firmware experience looks like. We're going to install the Onion OS custom firmware. And then we're going to go over what makes this device so popular. We've got a whole lot of ground to cover with this device. So let's jump in and let's get started. So I want to start just by doing some size comparisons just to show you how small this device really is. This is the Miu Mini next to an original Game Boy. This particular Game Boy has an IPS modded screen. I got this at 90s con back in March. And right off the bat, you could see that the Miu Mini is a great deal smaller than an original Game Boy. However, the screen size looks bigger. One of the upsides to the Miu Mini is the screen is pretty much bezel-less. The bezels are very minimal, which means we could fit more screen real estate into a tinier package. Let's take a look at a middle of the road device. Here's a Retroflag GPI Case 2, which comes in smaller than a Game Boy, but still dwarfs the Miu Mini in size. And now we're going to move a couple things around because I want to compare this device side by side to another Game Boy unit. This would be a Game Boy Advance SP. I picked this one up recently on eBay because I wanted a system that was like the limited edition Game Boy Advance SP that I had in college. However, this one is another Game Boy with an IPS display modification. And it appears to be the closest in size comparison to the Miu Mini, especially when you close the clamshell. So obviously for travel purposes, the two devices on the right are going to be much more pocketable and travel friendly than the two devices on the left. Here's a size comparison to the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. The Miu Mini still is very tiny in comparison and the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is advertised as one of the more pocketable devices. However, the RP2 Plus is definitely more ergonomically friendly than the Miu Mini. And the same holds true for the RG351P. It's a little bit wider than the Miu Mini, but it definitely does not feel as cramped just because of the landscape orientation of the buttons and joysticks. Here's the Miu Mini sister device, the Ambernic RG280V. And these devices are both a lot similar in size. In fact, I would say these two devices are the top contenders for mini retro handhelds. However, I would argue that the RG280V is just a little bit better to hold just because it's a little bit brickier. Whereas I've noticed with the Miu Mini, my hands will cramp up a lot quicker just because I feel like I'm holding them a lot closer together. But both of these devices are very small and very pocketable. And finally, we'll take a look at the Miu Mini's fierce older brother, the Ambernic RG351V. The 351V clearly dwarfs the Miu Mini in size. It's got a nice 3.5 inch OCA laminated screen and still maintains that DMG Game Boy form factor. The 351V still remains one of my favorite retro devices to this day. 
But as of right now, if I know I'm going to be on the go or sitting in a waiting room, the Miu Mini is going to be a contender for which device I bring. So let's take a look at the stock experience here. This is with the included SD card. And what you get here is a pretty bare bones interface that relies on standalone emulators to be able to play these retro games. The SD card did come preloaded with some games like Super Mario Bros. 3, but then it also came with some very weird ROM hacks like this Kamikaze Super Mario Bros. level. And I have no idea what's happening with this game. I just got taken to this level where I immediately died over and over again no matter what I did. Likewise, I got this other knockoff ROM called Mario TV, and again, I have no clue what's happening here. So while you will get some of the retail titles, a lot of these other games are just very weird and seem like bloat to me. And I don't necessarily agree with this practice. I don't think these games should come with the ROMs pre-installed at all. Out of the box, I couldn't even find a decent version of Tetris. I thought I was going to get the US version of NES Tetris. And instead, I got this weird original version. I'm not even sure where this version of Tetris was released. I know this is how it appeared in arcades, but this isn't the NES experience that I was looking for. And I just kept trying. I found Tetris game after Tetris game, and none of them were the original Tetris that I remember. Until finally, I started looking at the Game Boy end, and I was able to at least find the Game Boy version of Tetris. So while I was doing my testing, I ended up getting absorbed in that for a little bit. So the menu itself is pretty bare bones. This unit doesn't come with Wi-Fi or any crazy thing installed. It's strictly meant to play older games. So here you have a game section and a retro arc section. And the game section has a bunch of standalone emulators. And that's where you're going to find the vast majority of the content included on whatever SD card you get. And everything is listed by file name. Later on, when we move a no intro ROM set onto this device, you're going to see that it's going to maintain that same naming convention. And anytime you play a game, you can go into the menu just by pressing the menu button. And there are some basic options here. Continue, save, load, and exit game. And there's also a native menu for the standalone emulator that you're using. Unfortunately, in my case, I found that none of the options really worked. I couldn't save a state, I couldn't load a state, and even if I went into the native menu and tried saving state from there, I just kept getting failed or error messages. And the same held true when I tried to exit the game. It would freeze up and not take me back to the main menu, so I actually had to hold the power button down until the unit force restarted. And thankfully, I didn't have to do a battery pull. It just booted me right back into the main menu. But it seemed no matter what I did, I couldn't save or load states, and I couldn't get to the main menu on my own without having a force restart. And unfortunately, the SD cards that come with units like this are often prone to failure right away, so I'm pretty sure this is what's happening here. Now the stock firmware does give you a RetroArch menu with a bunch of different preloaded cores that you can boot right into. found that most of these with the stock card that came with the unit did not have games in them, which means you would probably have to move the ROMs around by connecting the SD card to the computer. But I did notice that the MGBA folder did have Kirby's Dream Land 2, so that's one of my favorites and I booted into it. And sure enough, it loaded with the Super Game Boy enhancements right off the bat, but I was still having issues saving and loading states even within RetroArch. And the only hotkey enabled is to hit the menu button to get into the menu and then try to quick RetroArch from there. But even with RetroArch, I was still having to force quit after trying to quit to the main screen. So that's it for me. I heard enough, so it's time to ditch this stock SD card and let's get some custom firmware on this device. So the first thing you want to do is to go into settings and check your 
device info to find out what MIU firmware you are on. And compare that to the information on the MIU firmware website to make sure that you have the latest version. Now at time of recording, I already had the latest version. It shipped with the device, so I did not have to update the firmware. But if you do, please make sure you follow all directions on the website, including removing the battery before upgrading. The website gives you a lot of warnings in big red text with pictures on how to upgrade and does warn you that there is a risk of brick if you do not follow the directions properly. So like with any device, be careful. All right, let's power this device down, take the SD card out, and let's just do a quick backup of the contents of the SD card, especially because I'm sure that this card is going. So once this SD card is plugged into the computer, go ahead and make a folder on your desktop or in your downloads folder called Miu, and just copy the contents of your SD card right over to the folder on your desktop. In my personal experience, I had to move all the folders one at a time because whenever I tried to move the entire SD card at once, it wouldn't happen. Even more evidence that I'm pretty sure I have a bad SD card, but I was able to back up all the information on it. So we can actually take this SD card and set it aside now. And once all this data is copied over, we're just going to keep it in a safe place just in case we need to access any of the files from the original firmware. But we're actually installing a custom firmware called Onion OS, and we're going to do that by starting fresh on a brand new SD card. So once these files are copied, I'm going to go ahead and eject this SD card, and I'm going to plug the new SD card into my computer. Next step is to navigate to the website for Onion OS. They have a GitHub page. I'll leave a link in the description. And you want to download the latest Onion version. At time of recording, it's 3.71. So you don't want to download the patch folder. You want to download the actual folder that says Onion. And once that file is downloaded, go ahead and unzip the contents right to the root of your SD card. And when all is said and done, you should have a folder called TMP update. Right now, this is the only folder that you need on this SD card. So once that content is unzipped and put on the root of your SD card, we can go ahead and eject it and plug it into our Mew Mini. Once the SD card is properly seated in the unit, go ahead and turn it on and you'll be greeted with an Onion OS installation screen. And if you see this screen that says installing core, you've done it right, but it is going to take a little bit of time on first boot. So go ahead, run to the bathroom really quick, come on back. And I would say between 5 and 10 minutes, you will be on this next screen that says Welcome to the Onion. And this is the actual manual for the operating system. This is accessible at any time, but you do have to go through the pages of the manual to continue with the installation. But it is actually useful. It gives you the shortcuts for when you're in a game, which means that this OS already comes with the RetroArch hotkeys set up for you. And once you're done reading the manual, it will prompt you to install the emulators and programs that you actually want on this device. So if there are certain systems that you are not planning on playing, you can actually not have them show up on the interface at all. And the nice thing about this custom firmware is if you change your mind, you can always add or subtract emulator cores down the line. And I went through and I only picked about 10 low-end emulation systems because I know what this device is capable of. But I also know what kind of build I want. I want to play NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance with a little bit of Genesis, Game Gear, and Neo Geo Pocket splashed in. I'm not looking to do any high-end emulation on this device. And once the installation's done, the device will reboot. And you will end up with a much nicer interface than what we experience with the stock SD card. It'll look very similar, but it's going to have a lot more functionality to it. 
First thing you'll notice is that the retro arc icon is gone because now we are dealing only with retro arc and all of those standalone emulators are actually not part of this firmware which streamlines the whole experience because now you're dealing with just one back end as opposed to several back ends. And the icons used in the OS are very nice. And you can also see the systems are sorted by year. And that's okay if you want to keep it that way, but if you do want to change the layout and names of your systems, you can go into the EMU folder on your SD card and open up the config JSON on for each of the individual systems and in notepad next to label you can change the label to just the title if you want to and I have went through and I did this with all of my systems and you can also change around any of the other icons or assets if you want to but right now I'm just changing the name while the SD card is connected to my computer I'm also going to scrape my box art and I'm going to use the scraper app We've used this app before, you need to have a screenscraper.fr account, and then go ahead and select recall box as the front end, and then you're going to have to check the box to include non-retro arc folders, and then go ahead and browse to the ROMs folder on the SD card, and it should list most of your systems, but I'm also going to show you what to do if not all the systems you want to scrape are listed. So let's go ahead and finish the wizard. And on the bottom left, we're going to use this plus sign to add the systems that are not in our list here. And as we do that, we also need to direct the program to the folder where the ROMs are located. So here I'm going to pick Nintendo, and you can see it defaults to ROMs slash NES. So we need to go ahead and change that to ROMs and FC because all the NES games are in the FC folder. And I'm gonna do that for the other systems that are missing. I'm gonna pick the proper system and then I'm going to direct the folder to the proper folder on the SD card. And when all is said and done, everything should be directed properly and should look like it does on the screen here. Your list might look different depending on what emulator cores you chose to install. So now let's go ahead and go to the media tab because now we're ready to start scraping our box art. Now Onion OS is very particular about how the box art should look. So we're gonna change a couple of things here. We're gonna use an internal mix and I'm actually going to use the recall box mix V2. And then we need to go ahead and resize the width to 256 so it will fit on the Mio Mini screen and the Mio Mini will recognize the box art. And we need to change our output folder to ROM root folder slash IMGS because that's the directory where Onion OS pulls the box art from. And that's it. Let's go ahead and run our scraping. It's going to warn you that scraping all systems is going to take a long time. That's okay. Let's scrape them all at once. And this is a great opportunity to step away for a little bit, grab a coffee or your beverage of choice, use the bathroom, maybe make some dinner, and then come on back and all your systems will be scraped. Now let's plug the SD card in, fire the unit back up, and see the fruits of our labor. Right away, you can see that my titles of my systems have changed due to the fact that I went in and edited those config files, and it's no longer sorted by year, it's sorted by alphabet. And actually, the one thing I like about this setup is SNES and Super Game Boy are on the second page because those are both things that would have played on the SNES anyway, so it's kind of cool to see them both together. The only thing I wish I had is instead of a Super Nintendo controller for Super Game Boy, I wish I had a picture of an actual Super Game Boy. So I'm going to try to find an image and get that to work. Now if you go into a system, you're still going to see a game list. But if you press right on the D-pad, you're actually going to see the box art and you can scroll through your games. 
one at a time and you have this really neat four images mix every time you do that and scrolling through games like this one at a time is actually one of my favorite ways to browse my ROM collection. I did something like this on my Retroflag GPI case and I like how it looks so much that I'm probably going to do similar builds with all of my retro handhelds. Not only is there a nice minimalistic view to it, but it also looks like I'm viewing these games as if I were looking at them on a shelf in my room. Getting into some gameplay here, Game Boy systems look pixel perfect. And there's some beautiful visual trickery going on here. To me, this looks almost better than an original Game Boy would look, but it still looks authentic. And what's happening here is the OS is running some filters in the background. There are some pixel shift internal palettes programmed by default. And you can change these in the RetroArch menu if you want. For example, if you want a more authentic experience, you can make it look more like the creamed spinach color of the original Game Boy. And you can also stretch out the image to fill up the whole screen, except have those little boxes on the side. But those settings don't seem to save from one game to the next, even if you save the configuration file or try to do core overrides. But quite frankly, I found that the default settings were actually perfectly fine anyways. And the more testing I did with this device, the more okay I was with just going into games and leaving them the way Onion OS programmed them. Those same filters are in place for Game Boy Color, and once you start adding color into the mix, the games actually look really beautiful. Game Boy Advance also maintains its aspect ratio, which means you're going to have perfect pixels, but you're also going to have black bars on the top and bottom. But this screen is so small that those are barely noticeable. And I took the time to actually find a version of Super Mario Advance 4 that has the e-reader levels already unlocked. Apparently they did this for the Wii U Virtual Console of the game. And if you're concerned about ROM legality, I would go on the Wii U eShop and grab this game while the eShop is still open. And then you'd be perfectly okay to have a backup of this specific version of the game. And the e-reader levels are already unlocked, so you can play some weird levels like Mario 3 with vegetables, or remakes of original Super Mario Bros. levels, but with Super Mario Bros. 3 physics and graphics. And some of these levels are very interesting, and some are actually super hard. One problem I did find on the Miu Mini that is with platformers or games that require quick hands, I was cramping up pretty quickly because of how tight my hands were against this device. I really struggled playing platformers on the Miu Mini. Even beat-em-up games like Ninja Turtles the arcade game gave me a bit of a hard time because of how cramped my hands were. Speaking of NES games, they run with the normal 2X RetroArc filter, which gives you a really crisp and clear picture, but may also take up system resources. So it's not really recommended for higher-end systems, but for NES it seems to work just fine. And I showed this system to my buddy Fred, and he actually couldn't believe how crisp NES games looked with this filter on. However, if playing the NES version of this game is not your cup of tea, you can run some early arcade games on this device. So here's the exact same game, but it's the original arcade version. And it also runs very well on this device. There are some MAME and Final Burn Alpha games that will run decently, but the later the publication of the game, the harder it's going to run on this device. Early stuff runs really good though. Genesis games did not seem to be a problem. Again, they look beautiful on this device. They may also be running the normal 2X filter. You won't have any trouble running Genesis on this device. SNES is where you might start running into trouble. Most SNES games will run fine, but of course things like Yoshi's Island will have a little bit of slowdown. The performance isn't terrible here, and my actual concern was 
more with the controls of the Mew Mini than the actual performance of the emulator because as you could see, I struggled. So I thought maybe this system isn't ideal for platformers, let's try a JRPG. And my hands did feel less cramped because I wasn't trying to push so many buttons at once. But I also did find mild performance issues even in Final Fantasy 3. There were some audio stutters, especially when it came to the way the wind was blowing. And if you have concerns with the way the SNES games with these versions are playing, you can always go and play the Game Boy Advance ports. However, you're going to notice a sharp change in the music and sound quality just because the Game Boy Advance's audio was not as advanced as the Super Nintendo. And I guess I never noticed it when I was younger, but man, is it jarring now. And same thing with the Game Boy Advance port of Yoshi's Island. No audio stutters to speak of or frame rate dips, but the game is still really hard to play on the Miu Mini just because of how cramped it is. And the audio track really is not as good. And I'm still struggling with this one platform. For accessories, I actually bought this playing card case from USA Gear. And it's just big enough to fit the Miu Mini because the Miu Mini is about as big as a deck of playing cards and it does have a nice little carabiner. So this could attach to my belt buckle and this could be super portable. Say if I need to go to a party or a doctor's office or take public transportation. This case works really well for that and I'll leave a link in the video description if this is something that you're interested in. And one last thing to note, I didn't take footage of it, but there is a theme switcher in the Onion app section. So I was able to change my theme to this switch looking one and it's nice and colorful and fits the device really well. And there are plenty of other themes to choose from, so I do highly recommend you take a minute and check that out when you get a chance. All right, we covered a lot. We got you from zero to hero on your Mew Mini, and we talked about what this device is capable of. So let's go ahead and do commendations and condemnations. So let's start with commendations, and there's a lot of good to talk about when it comes with this device. But if I were to focus on just a few key themes, one would be the absolute portability on this device. It's very pocketable. Or you can throw it in a tiny case and clip it to your belt and pretty much take it anywhere you want. I also like that the Onion operating system does pretty up the games really nice. They did a lot of the legwork for you, which makes this a very easy system to set up. You can probably spend a little under an afternoon really getting this device ready to go. That's the nice thing about this particular device. It gets out of its own way and just lets you play games. Also, any operating system that will let me change the theme is a win in my book. And I only paid $40 for this device, plus another $15 for an SD card. And that actually costs less than most modern games today. So there aren't really a lot of very good devices at this price point, but I'm happy to say that the Miu Mini is definitely one of them. All right, let's move on to condemnations, things that this device could improve upon. For one, because of how small it is, it is really cramped, which makes this a very hard system to play platformers on, but puzzle games and RPGs will be just fine. There is questionable SNES performance on this device. It will play most games, but those special chip titles might struggle, which to me, in this day and age, even with budget chipsets, should just not be a problem. Most systems today can play the SA1 games and the FX chip games, so I kind of wish this system was not a struggle as well. This system is also not for the accident prone. The materials used to build it are not the strongest. So I plan on babying this thing because I'm afraid as to what might happen to it if I drop it, especially with a removable battery cover. I would really hate to see that break, especially given how bummed I was when my RG300 broke earlier this year. And finally, I'm still messing around with this device, but I'm finding it difficult saving my RetroArch configurations, even on Onion OS with a new SD card, and I'm sure there's a way to do it, I just haven't figured it out yet. 
and I wish it was a little bit more cut and dry. But overall, I have to say, for this price point, I believe the hype with this device now that I actually have one in-house. And I still need to put it through its paces a little bit more, but if you're looking for a budget retro device, and you can find one of these at that $40 price point, it might actually be worth it for you. Especially considering the quick setup time this device affords you versus other devices. We've covered a lot of ground with the Miu Mini, but it's time to wrap up this video, so thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about this device in the comments below. Do you have a Miu Mini, and are you enjoying it? And if you're on the fence about purchasing a device like this, hopefully this video helped to sway your decision. And if you already own one, hopefully I was able to help you make your device a little bit better. And if you want to continue the conversation, you can also join the Budget Aquaman Discord. Link for that Discord is in the video description. Again, thank you so much for watching, and if this video was helpful to you in any way, please be sure to like and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now, and don't stop believing.